Energy. Celebrating 16 years of Young Turks. It is the city by the bay. It is the startup capital of the world. Hello and welcome to this very special edition of Young Turks. We come to you from San Francisco. Now the Google Launchpad Accelerator program is what we are going to be telling you about on the show today. So if you have ever wondered what goes into an accelerator program, what do startups here that have come from 33 different countries do, what kind of mentorship comes their way, then you should watch this program. So let's get right into the highlights of what we have on the show today. There's so much innovation happening around the world and most companies here in Silicon Valley are blind to it. The program has been very useful for us from the perspective of uh, just being able to scale a technology startup. So I'm walking towards 301 Howard Street. This is the heart of the business district in downtown San Francisco. And this is where the Google Launchpad Accelerator is. So let's go in and take a look. Started five years ago on the Google campus in Tel Aviv, the Launchpad Accelerator is now headquartered in San Francisco. Over the last three years, 78 startups from emerging markets have made it to the Launchpad program that brings with it an intensive six-month mentorship on product design, business models and tech support from the best developers and leaders at Google as well as tech companies and VCs from Silicon Valley. This year, the focus was on artificial intelligence and machine learning startups and we caught up with the global lead of the Google Accelerator, Roy Glassberg, and began by asking him why this program is at the heart of Google. Three years ago, we have decided that we want to focus on emerging markets specifically. Uh, we've realized that we've been using Silicon Valley methodology too much in order to educate other markets and have everybody fit into that box, which doesn't make a lot of sense. So what is this SFO box or the Silicon Valley box that startups in parts of the world like India shouldn't fit into necessarily or shouldn't pressure themselves to fit into? So uh, a few examples of the way of thinking that might create a challenge. Um, one, you will see a lot of investors looking for solutions that would work in America, that would work for the American consumers. Uh, which. You know, if you look at emerging markets and the market potential, it's, it's a lot bigger and much more interesting in my eyes. So one, that's kind of a trap we need to avoid. Second, success for the VC industry is billion dollar exits. Yes. I would love to see more companies being built in emerging markets, uh, more sustainable businesses growing uh, at their pace, but providing jobs, providing value to the users and not necessarily look for these uh, unicorns that we call them. Let's talk about, you know, the unicorn because you brought it up. Would you say that there is a sort of return to rationality? So one, there's no return to rationale in Silicon Valley because there's no need to. All right. uh, there's enough money here. It's not a matter of money, there's enough innovation and the speed and pace in which businesses grow. Um, you know, if it's not going to be that investment, it's going to be the other one, but we're going to have more unicorns and we're going to have more amazing companies being built. How is the Google Launchpad Accelerator different? So first we focus on emerging markets only. And today our last class is comprised of 33 companies from 17 countries representing four continents. So I think we've built the biggest experiment in the world on how to help emerging market startups succeed. Uh, second, we look at product market fit companies. So these are companies that already have traction, have users, have secured significant investments. What makes it very different from any other program is that this is the heart of Google. I mean, we're in San Francisco, but we have 40 Google teams involved in this program. Okay. So we're bringing... From Android to cloud. Any technology that you can think of from Google machine X, learning. machine learning, AI, and then we have hiring and, and talent acquisition and business processes and compensation. Involved. And you're doing this without taking equity in any of these uh, companies, right? No equity, nothing. So what does Google get out of it? So, and I want to link this to the next billion user program, which is the next big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, actually at Google is to figure out where the next billion users are going to come from, what they're going to look like, what they're going to be doing uh, on the internet, and how does uh, the Launchpad Accelerator tie in with that longer strategy of the next billion users for Google. 
So I think the biggest value we provide here for Google is learning. And that's what my team is all passionate about. Um, there's so much innovation happening around the world and we are blind to it. Most companies here in Silicon Valley are blind to it. Uh, our ability to help learn, support entrepreneurs around the world helps us rethink how we're building developer tools, how are we looking at our products. When you're building a developer platform and you're sitting in Silicon Valley and you assume that everybody has the newest iPhone in their pocket and they have full bandwidth all the time uh, and you know everybody speaks English and everybody can do their login using yeah. their Facebook account or whatever, yeah. or Gmail account, um, that doesn't happen. Yeah, I believe we've had 26 startups from India already participate over the last three years. So talk to us about what's different about uh, India and if we had to put India in a triangle between uh, San Francisco, Tel Aviv uh, and Bangalore, uh, you know, what are the points of difference and what are the degrees of connection? So India has always been kind of the top of, uh, of, of the program from the level of startups that we bring in, uh, but also from the maturity of the market. When we look at kind of advanced technologies, like today when we have a uh, big focus on AI and machine learning in the right. program, some of the best examples we found were in India because of okay. the level of development. Okay. Because I don't see a new technology emerging and Indian developers not automatically absorbing, embedding it and coming up with solutions. I think the speed of execution in India and the adoption of new technologies is amazing and we didn't have that five years ago. Okay. India was not there five years ago so it's really amazing to see the growth of the Indian market. Our film was founded in 2015. Um, we were working outside the country um, and we saw India has like the fundamentals which really you have 250 plus million people with connected devices and you have a movie crazy population. I think that you know 50% of the, the total Indian entertainment uh, industry is Bollywood but really like almost the other 50% is regional languages. So we said look there are lots of people who are actually focused on Bollywood and there's a huge audience of people, Tamil, Telugu, Canada, Malayalam, you know, 200 films per language per year and no one is really serving those people. Our entire vision was to make streaming available for everybody across India. It's just not the top 5 to 10 percent who can stream. Our compression technology is the world's best right now. Netflix or YouTube would struggle to stream in a Velour or a Coimbatore but on a fast film stream seamless. So when you go to these places, you, you don't expect connectivity always. So if a guy tries to open an app and uh, he wants to browse it without the internet, we allow it, them to do that. So we have our, our uh, images cached, our movies cached. And uh, one of the great features that we were the first app to do in the country is where we allow a user to share an entire movie with another fast film user without any data. But this is 100% legal and encrypted. So we don't believe that um, a premium video service like ours can survive on, on advertising. We're only charging 40 rupees a month right now. Um, so it's affordable really for you know, the entire mass market. The number one be most important insight we got is like how important the customer is to our entire product design, how he should be at the center of our product design. But we also know there are some people that have downloaded the app and then uninstalled it. And you know, we've, we've learned so much in the last two weeks about you know, going back to those users, understanding like, you know, you know, why you love it, why you don't love it, and then doing very, very quick iteration cycles to improve the product. One of the most important things in UI UX is to understand that there is no such thing as good application or bad application. It's always about the match between the application, what you design as a startup, and your customers or your users. Get out of the building, meet the users, and conduct a proper usability testing. Startups tend to neglect their users' emotions. Today, in our society, most people don't buy what they need. They buy what they want. And want is all about emotions. And if you want to create a great product, one of the most important things on earth is to know exactly what your users are going to feel and to make sure that your application 
will support this set of emotions. And the team at Rail Yatri started with an emotional response to the travails of rail travel in India. One of the largest downloaded travel apps, the challenge for Rail Yatri was getting data to dance to their tunes. Our own personal experiences in travel, in traveling long distance in India, then worrying about whether your ticket would get confirmed or not, or standing at a railway station trying to think, trying to think, you know, where will, when will your train arrive? So the best way to kind of look at it or answer that question is collect data, build up a big layer of analytics, machine learning intelligence layer on top of it, and start answering some of the questions, and that's how we started. Our algorithms have become much smarter now than they were two years back. Now, getting data in India is a challenge, getting location in India is a challenge, because you have to do it in a very battery efficient way for journeys that run into like 14 hours, 24 hours, and that's an area Google has already created, you know, kind of excel in that sense. So that's definitely one area that we are very interested to understand how we can optimize on that better. For the next two years, for us, that the, the value of this platform would just not reach to the consumers, but it would also reach to the businesses, you know, who want to serve these travelers better. We do not intend to charge the travelers. The businesses should pay. And, uh, and we believe in the Indian market, that's the only model that is ready to scale. With that, it's time for a break on this special edition of Young Talks that's coming to you from San Francisco and we've been bringing you all the highlights of the Google Launchpad Accelerator program. A lot more coming up, so keep watching. Celebrating 16 years of Young Turks. Welcome back to the special edition of Young Turks. We come to you from San Francisco where we are bringing you all the action from the Google Launchpad Accelerator program. Now there are six Indian startups that have come down to San Francisco to be part of this two-week on-ground incubation. I'm going to chat with one of them right now. The company is called India Lens. They are Delhi-based and what they essentially do is uh, underwrite credit to people like you and me that might not essentially find easy bank loans uh, coming our way. So let's go down and let's talk to them and figure out what they've been up to. We were working together in London for a bank called Capital One and uh, got a move back to India, I think 2012, late 2012. Early 2014 is when he called me. He said, you know, I'm looking to start something. Do you know anyone who'd like to move back? At that point he said, I was talking to him, I was said, you know, why not me? So Capital One was essentially trying to lend to the masses and they were doing this by using additional data about the customer. We are trying to do the same in India, which is saying that trying to help more people to get a loan uh, from the banks and NBFCs. Because people are using cell phones, they leave a large digital footprint that we are then able to leverage to understand uh, some of the parameters that we want to look at. Traditionally, when you look at underwriting by banks, there is an underwriter evaluating applications manually. So they're looking at a large number of documents. What we've been able to bring to the table for the banks is a lot of automation in these processes in saying that how we, you guys can uh, automate looking at bank statements, how you can automate looking at, let's say, credit bureau data, and how we can bring it all together in being able to understand the risk difference between two individuals. Google is the leader in machine learning technology, artificial intelligence technology. But outside of that, I think the program has been very useful for us from the perspective of uh, just being able to scale a technology startup. There's been a big focus on HR practices, hiring the right talent, uh, how to, you know, after hiring the right talent, how to make sure they take up uh, leadership positions. Uh, so we've been able to speak to a lot of Google leaders and leaders from uh, outside Google who are mentors to us. The problem of dealing with difficult employees. Employees who aren't meeting deadlines, uh, who, are, who create a negative environment in the company. How would you solve for this? The first thing is, are the expectations clear? Now that sounds very simple, but really many people when they look at an employee that's difficult, that's, it's not, that's not delivering, they will very quick, be quick to say, that they just don't have the skills for it. Well, chances are, if you haven't given them that feedback, when you haven't, if you haven't been explicit about you know, the expectations of the role, um, chances are that that's the, that's the number one problem. The next thing you would check for, before you check on skill, is you would first check on motivation as a second step. Do they actually care to do the work? Um, do they see that this role act actually contributes to their own personal career goals in the long term? Then the last thing you would check for um, would be skill. Do they have the knowledge, do they have the capabilities, the skills um, to do the work? 
Now, if you, might, if you decide that they don't have the skill, then you might do a few things that will not cost you a dime. You might pair them up with someone who does the work really excellently and have this person mentor them very closely for a period of a few, you know, a few weeks. And one startup that is bringing the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning to connect the right person with the right job is Edge Networks. Founded in 2012, the venture today uses semantic analysis and predictive modeling to make not just hiring easy, but also manage talent at large enterprises like Wipro. We started the company in 2012 and uh, the genesis of the company is to match people to jobs. And I think the key factor is we wanted to be able to read a resume, read a job description like the human brain, right? Uh, we found that to be a global problem and we found that to be everyone's problem, right? We built an application and we took it out to, to Wipro and we said, listen, you hire in volumes, would this be interesting to you? One of the things that was critical to the, the, the organization itself is the pivot that Wipro uh, brought us into. They said, you know, you're going to acquire talent and you're going to speed up that process. But I think the difference is, can you do this for our employees? Can you actually look at unstructured information within the organization that could range from performance appraisal information to uh, work experience summaries to project experience summaries to courses and certifications? Could you bring it from disparate systems? Could you analyze the unstructured information and bring us one version of the truth? So not only are we able to optimize workforces internally, if we can't find a person internally, we're able to acquire the talent externally using an automated machine uh, to ensure that that process is quality controlled. We have gone through 22 million resumes, about 9 million of them being unique resumes. We've gone through about 3.9 million job descriptions, right? And the way we've built our neural network at the back end is a lot more classified than it ever was. So imagine now going after enterprise customers and giving them this value proposition. Not only are you making money, but you're improving value across, again, a large employee base. Okay. Now build an SMB product on top of that, and you've got this value proposition that can easily peter down. So when you hand out the small and medium business product, you're able to quality control the value proposition much better because you've got a lot of learning that you can transfer. There are some unique challenges uh, for machine learning based uh, startups. Uh, first, I would like to start with the, the product strategy uh, challenges. Turns out that uh, lean startup methodologies doesn't really apply or work for machine, uh, machine learning based startups. It takes about a year or two years to get enough data to be, to be able to provide in, uh, insights and lots of value using machine learning. There are a lot of subdomains under machine learning. It's, it's, a, big, uh, it's a big word. Um, you can't compare a company that is doing NLP, natural language processing, and a company that is doing computer vision. And even if you look at the computer vision, there are companies that are doing um, object detection, like we have here recipe book. They, you snap a picture and they will automatically um, uh, recognize ingredients in this, in this picture. So that's one technology. So the technology depth that you need to go to uh, is extremely, extremely deep. One trick that we found out, in some cases, uh, if you bring a mentor who is really good at one subdomain and you connect it with a startup that is doing a completely different thing, uh, they can learn one from the other and apply mathematical models that people are using at, in one subdomain, like in NLP, over uh, computer vision. Um, and that became really, really, really helpful. And that's exactly what this team based in Kochi has done. Their app, Recipe Book, is built on deep learning computer vision technology and uses natural language processing to simplify recipe discovery and cooking. We are working on something else. Uh, recipe book wasn't our primary product. Uh, so working on something called visual search on e-commerce. At the same time we were staying together in an apartment, we had this typical cooking issues. And uh, Nikhil came out with an idea, why don't we try this computer vision for discovering recipes. That was the starting point. And we uploaded this thing on the store and Google recognized us uh, with editor's choice. So we use something called deep learning computer vision in the background for recognizing food items. So we are manually trained around 700 ingredients in the system and we are getting good number of images from users. So, so far we have around 3 million downloads and around 1.5 million images have been uploaded by our users. So the same images have been reused for retraining our system. Getting the talent in our place like Kochi and also in Bangalore, it's difficult, it's more difficult. So what we are doing is like, we have some friends here, so Nikhil uh, recruit them and give us basic training. 
and they will do the work. Our next phase is to raise out the company in the US and to acquire more talents from here. So for us, one good thing happened to us is that since we are from Cochin, uh, we didn't have access to all those uh, uh, fancy investors and all those things. So uh, in the, from the day one, we have been trying to bootstrap. So uh, so we had a revenue coming from advertisement, which is enough for a small team to sustain. Uh, thankfully, we got right mentors uh, here in the Launchpad program. So they're helping us to set up the right strategies for getting out to the market, both in the B2C and the B2B side. With that, it's a wrap on this very special edition of Young Turks. Tell us what you thought of the program. You can write to us at uh, youngturks at nw18.com. You can also ping us on Facebook and on Twitter. It was a pleasure bringing you this show. And uh, till next time, goodbye and thanks for watching. Celebrating 16 years of Young Turks.